Chris Lee and Blaine Gilmore, Southeastern 14, here to talk to Kentucky Wildcats, who had an interesting season last year. I think mildly disappointing. Loses, does Kentucky, a quarterback to the NFL, but gains an offensive coordinator who was tremendous last we saw him in Kentucky two years ago. Gains maybe a better quarterback if he's healthy. And and apologies to Will Levis. This is not a a poop on Will Levis podcast. And as a Titans fan, I'm rooting for him. But he was not well a year ago. And the offensive line did not protect him. So that was kind of a disaster. But flipping a page, Liam Cohen's back. Kentucky's always got a stout defense. And I know you're really, really high on this team, Blaine. Should be a very interesting year in Lexington. I am. I'm always a big fan of Mark Stoops and what he's able to do there in Lexington. I think his just overall build of that program uh, speaks for itself. Year in and year out, they're able to to compete at, at a high level and and you know win games that some people don't think they should win. But you know, last year was a little bit of a dip downward. I think that they can be right back there pushing it that nine ten. You know, if everything goes well and they they win maybe one that they shouldn't 11 win mark this year i think they could really uh with including a bowl game i think they could really have a big year in lexington well they've been to i believe seven bowl games in a row now that includes the 2020 covid season which was a little bit weird they went four and six in the sec five and six overall and went to a bowl which was pretty good with the all sec schedule but point is he has gotten that program to a floor that I don't think most people expected Kentucky could have. Absolutely. And I think, you know, he's done it mostly with having to patchwork together offense. There was a couple of years there, like that COVID year, they didn't even have a real quarterback on the roster. They were having to run wildcat, literal wildcat, Kentucky wildcat, wildcat (laughs) offense the entire time. And then now, you know, this year, could be the best offense that Mark Stoops has had. And you mentioned Liam Cohen coming back. This is going to be an exciting team to watch. I think they've added some key pieces, as you mentioned, to help protect Devin Leary up front, something that they weren't good at doing with Will Levis last year. So excited to see what Kentucky can do on that front. But, yeah, it it is a to the point with this program where there is no SEC team that walks into Lexington or invites Kentucky to their stadium and thinks, oh, well, we, j- we can just cakewalk through this one. They know that you're going to be in for a physical match each and every time they play the Wildcats. Blaine, let's talk about Devin Leary, because I know you are a big, big fan of his. I know he had some health issues a year ago, but he's an older guy, but he was a class of 2018 guy, I believe. I think, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I feel like maybe you feel he may be the most impactful transfer in the league. I think it's without question. I mean, you look at what Will Levis was. He was a converted, you know, battering ram at Penn State that grew into a NFL quarterback. That's, you know, testament to his hard work, testament to what Liam Cohen did with him the year that he was there being his his coordinator. Um, And he's he's a talented guy with a strong arm. But Devin Leary is a more natural passer. This is a guy who has broken some of Philip Rivers' records at NC State when he was there. And anytime you're even mentioned in the same breath as Philip Rivers, then you know you're doing something right. But when he was fully healthy, that 2021 season, 60, almost 66% pass completion, 3,433 yards, um, had a 35 to 5 uh, touchdown to interception ratio and took NC State to new heights in their program as well in terms of where they hadn't been in a little while beating Clemson and things of that nature. So I really think when you're talking about Devin Leary, you're talking about a guy who's seen a lot of football and now is going to have better athletes on the outside, Chris, than he has ever had before at NC State in the three receivers that are returning for Kentucky and a talented true freshman coming in as well. I think that Devin Leary is a going to be a very impactful transfer for the Kentucky Wildcats. Yeah, you beat me to the next storyline. In my mind, I don't know that there's many teams in the league that have got a better receiving trio than Dane Key, Barry and Brown, and Tavion Robinson. And look, there were two things working against those guys a year ago. One was Will Levin. 
being healthy enough and having enough time to get them the ball, which I think he got sacked, what, 41 times? That's from memory. I think that's close. And, you know, the other thing is Brown and Key were freshmen. Yeah. You don't often see freshmen come in the league and make an impact at receiver that quickly, much less two of them. I think that is one of the absolute best receiving trios in the league, if not in the country. No doubt. And and you add in Anthony Brown now, a true freshman to those guys who is immensely talented, highly coveted guy, recruit that's going to come in and he will play some this year. But you mentioned those guys, Key, Robinson, and Brown are immensely talented. And listen, no no offense to, you know, Scandrillo or the offense last year, but he was not – Robinson came in and everybody thought, okay, well, this is going to be – Wandell Robinson 2.0 they're going to use him Mm -hmm. much like that and that was not the case didn't get the ball in his hands nearly enough in the creative ways that you're going to see Liam Cohen do because remember Liam Cohen who's he a disciple of who's he spent time with he spent time with Sean McVay well who does Sean McVay use utilize really well Cooper Cup they're going to use Tavion Robinson in that same type of mold and then have those big big talented fast receivers on the outside, Barry and Brown can fly, and Dane Key is a really, you know, prototypical type receiver out there out wide. I think it's going to be a really good mix in the passing game for Kentucky. Yeah, and if you want to get an idea, and again, this was not all Rick Scandrello's issue, I don't think, because of health and, and some personnel losses and such. But Kentucky, two years ago under Cohen, averaged 5.8 yards per rushing play. Two years ago, five or excuse me, four point four last year. So almost a drop of a yard and a half per rush play. And remember, a rush play that that takes out sacks. Sacks were a pass play. So when Kentucky threw the ball, it wasn't pretty either. Dropped from eight point zero yards per throw to six point zero. Now the one thing that you could maybe criticize, and I don't know if this is a Liam Cohen thing. We had one year of it to see. Kentucky had its highest turnover rate. Of the last five years under Cohen, it turned it over 2.7% of the time. I don't know if that's just a small sample size fluke, if that is just uh, taking more chances or what it was, but just thought I'd mention that. But speaking of the running game, Kentucky adds Ray Davis, 1,000-yard rusher at Vanderbilt. And look, he is – I've seen him play a bunch. One of my favorite players in the league. Now, he's not a breakaway threat. I think they – it's a downgrade from Chris Rodriguez – who had some disciplined problems off the field, which kept him out of some games a year ago. So, so maybe a better clubhouse guy. But not that explosiveness that Rodriguez had. But still, Davis was dependable. He can pick up blocking assignments. He can catch the ball out of the backfield. He does not fumble the ball. I don't think he fumbled the ball once last year, which could be an issue for Rodriguez. I'm really looking forward to seeing how he does in that attack because at Vanderbilt, that was not exactly a spread the field, scare you downfield offense, which made it harder for him to run. It's going to be different circumstances for him in Lexington. He's going to see a little bit of a lighter box, I think, Chris. Uh, he's going to, yeah. going to have less bodies in there that he's trying to trying to run through. And I think, you know, at the the addition of two transfer tackles, Marquez Cox from Northern Illinois and Cortland Ford from USC, massive human beings coming in there. They're going to be leading the way for Ray Davis. You're talking about a guy, like you mentioned, over a 1,000 yards for Vanderbilt. I like to joke and say, hey, if that's a 1,000 yards uh, behind Vanderbilt's offensive line, it's 1,600 Mm -hmm. somewhere else, you know. So I just think that, you know, with the guys they have in the middle, because that wasn't the problem. They really struggled on the tackles. The the guys they have in the middle with Horsey, with Burton, and with Cox in the middle are really solidified and a very uh, experience-laden group. And I think that's going to help Ray Davis in front of him. And like you said, a light in box. If they're having to worry about how Liam Cohen, what he does to defenses, he gets them going side to side first, Chris, with quick screens, with with quick game. Also running Ray Davis laterally before he starts busting them up the middle, get those big guys tired, front sevens running side to side. I think Ray Davis is going to be a big uh, beneficiary of that. And listen, he's got a running mate in Jutal McLean that – that they think can can do some things as well, Ramon Jefferson. So there there are some other guys that'll be able to spell him and give him give him a, a breather, which maybe he didn't get quite as much of at Vanderbilt as well. 
Yeah, and you hit on it, uh, although you didn't spell it exactly like this. Three returning starters, left guard, center, right guard. That that helps a lot. Guys that have played a lot of ball in this league, and, and I, I think that is going to fit Ray Davis pretty well because he does like to run inside. Now, I want to ask you about the defense because that is where Kentucky's bread has been buttered. This one, to me, in terms of names, may not pop as much. Last year, they didn't have some of the star power some of the Kentucky defenses have had in years past, but they did hold their own. They did have their moments, the, the Tennessee game where it wasn't very pretty. But Brad White's defenses have been pretty good. Let's see, year to year, 21 to 22, they gave up just that much more on running plays. 4.7 to 4.8. Teams ran it a lot more against them last year. Went from 46% to 53% last season. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, now, the pass defense was kind of silently pretty good. They, they went from giving up 6.2 yards a throw to 5.6. Forced turnovers at a higher rate, too. Uh, so some things looked better for them a year ago. Um, you know, they kind of quietly gave up 19.2 points a game. I didn't didn't really realize that till we're doing this just now because it, it just wasn't a, a unit that popped off the paper. But this is a team where their identity has been built on defense since Stoops got there, and and you you kind of always trust him to field a pretty good unit, even if the names aren't guys that dot all American and, and all conference lists, and that, that's mostly the case this year too yeah i mean but you're, you're talking about some guys who have some some experience on that defense you know yeah. the a andrew phillips and jordan lovett are experienced in the secondary and now you add a key transfer like jq hardaway uh in the mix from cincinnati just and jq hardaway was pursued hard by by teams like georgia and and texas and other schools like that out of out of uh high school ended up going to cincinnati remember that was cincinnati coming off a playoff appearance, Cincinnati, mm -hmm. and now he's uh, now he's transferred to Kentucky after um, the the exit of Cincinnati's Cincinnati's coach to Wisconsin. So when it comes down to it, now what you have is experience in the secondary. You have a good mix of experience at at linebacker with. Uh, some new guys that are taken over but have been in the program, like Trevin Wallace, he takes over in the middle, but he's been in the program. He's a junior. He's a third-year guy. So he's he, he's not been a starter, but he's had some experience. And they've got some big bodies up front, and yeah. it, it starts with uh, Deion Walker uh, up there, 350-plus pounds. You know, and the Octavius Oxendine, he's a senior. He's been around forever, it seems like, um, that is going to be right there with him uh, playing more of a three-technique type role there so octavius oxen nine uh dion walker jj weaver has great length on that jack position um and and is you know a guy that is a true leader for them so i think this is going to be just another prototypical because like you mentioned 19 points a game when you're giving up 19 points a game in modern college football you're doing something right chris that is uh that is impressive yeah i sold them a little short because weaver is going to be a guy that's going to be on some preseason all, all SEC checklists, been very productive. Seems like he's been there forever. Deion Walker is kind of an up and coming guy. He's a true freshman a year ago, was a tremendous kid out of Detroit. And th so they got those two. They do have a couple of names, but th they and also, you mentioned Silver transferring in. Well, yes, they, they also get that from North Carolina. I don't know how big of a factor do you think he'll be? Because he, he just didn't play much at UNC. Didn't, didn't play a whole lot, but he was immensely talented, like in terms of highly coveted out of high school. Um, I, sometimes guys just need a new a new to, new coat of paint, if you will, Chris, uh, yeah. and, and to move somewhere else. But anytime you get a guy that's border, you know, getting around six foot, six foot one, over 300 pounds, uh, you know, Mark Stoops will take that in a heartbeat and just add that because that's the key in the SEC, right? The teams that are most successful on defense, they're able to roll six, seven, eight in the on the defensive line and stay fresh. And I think Kentucky will have at least, you know, six guys that they can that they can roll through there and then have those those experienced linebackers, you know, Deer Jackson. Uh, Trevin Wallace, guys that they want to kind of see step up into those roles, but JJ Weaver and Alex Safari Jr. They've been there, they've done that. So I think uh, it'll be it'll be a good mix there in the middle. But yeah, I, I think that the 
the the transfer of silver will play a little bit of a role, but you're looking more in the middle of Oxendine, Walker, Hayes. I mean, they, these are guys that that can Kentucky is going to be able to utilize and, and really, you know, stop people's running game first is what is what they they are predicated on, and then that that makes you more successful against the pass like they were last year. Yeah, one of their trademarks is just being huge uh, across the front, and that no exception this year. They they go, let's see, silver three twenty two is what Kentucky listed him in the spring. Beasley two ninety two, Walker three forty eight, um, maybe Hayes three seventeen. So I guess they got four three hundred pounders, which is yeah, you know, the, the Kentucky's made that work for. And one other thing. Uh, we didn't mention Derek Jackson. That's another kid who's played a lot of ball there who comes back on that front seven. So, again, that, that's another place where experience and continuity helps you a bit. Oh, yeah. And, Brad, Pete, you, you mentioned – you invoked Brad White's name. People don't give – you never hear Brad White's he, name. He never comes about, up. Yeah, when you talk about great defensive coordinators, but he has consistently been a great defensive coordinator for Kentucky, him and, and Mark Stoops working together. And I think – I think, you know, if you look back to two years ago, I think Brad White and Liam Cohen worked well together. And that that's something that people don't talk about a lot of times. The offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator, you know, being on the same page and, and having an idea of, okay, here's how we want to play the game. Here's how we want to handle our, our possessions and stuff like that. And I think just the familiarity there, them having had success and now with having even better players because Kentucky has been – uh, doing a good job recruiting. Uh, they've been creative with how they use NIL and things of that nature. So I think that Kentucky is uh, is in good position from a depth standpoint. Um, there's a couple of positions that they're that they're young at in the in the secondary, but other than that, I think that they're they're set up to have another successful year on the defensive side of the ball. Well, I'll tell you where they're interesting, too, is special teams. I don't really know about their kicking game. These aren't guys that, that have got much in the way of of track record. Chance Poor's kicked there, but they had issues kicking a year ago. But then, on the other hand, there's the return game. Uh, yeah. Barry and Brown, could, it, it busted a few last year. Robinson's a good return guy. They are very interesting on special teams. Dangerous in the return game. Just don't kick it to Kentucky. Yeah, the people are either going to kick it out of bounds or kick it to the end zone on kickoffs because Barry and Brown, if it's if it's even in the back of the end zone, he'll bring it out. He doesn't care. Like he he has no fear and he has track speed. So uh, you know he he should have. He came real close to winning that old Miss game last year if it wasn't for a procedure procedure penalty, I believe. Yeah. So. When you're talking about uh, speed and big plays, when Kentucky needs him, Barry and Brown is a guy that can do that. Yeah, they, they, they caught a bad break. I think that wiped off a, a touchdown pass, did it? Not? Yeah, go-ahead touchdown to win the game. Yeah. yeah. On the other hand, they, they caught a big break against Missouri on, on a special teams play. I think a roughing the punter 40 yards behind the line of scrimmage. But, you know, I, I guess it was the right call, but what are you going to do? So, I, I guess the breaks – well, you, you, I wouldn't say a break's evened out. Uh, Will Levis not being healthy was not a break that evened out. But anyway, it'll, it'd be interesting to see how they going go going forward. They've done what Kentucky generally does, and we previewed their schedule in a separate video, Blaine, but should be a, a slam dunk 3-0 start, Ball State, Eastern Kentucky, Akron, and then a road trip to Vanderbilt. And you're going, okay, what, what's the big deal about that? Well, Vandy beat them a year ago, uh, so that's kind of a revenge game. And a game that could be interesting, Vanderbilt at that point will be uh, possibly three and zero itself. So that that'll be an interesting one. I I think that middle part of the schedule, you know, Florida after that at Georgia, they played Georgia pretty tough in the past. Yeah, um, Missouri they, they always, again competitive a year ago. Well. Yeah, that that Tennessee game, um, it, it was a complete bloodletting a year ago. Uh, but but that Kentucky's made that interesting in the past. I just think that middle part of the schedule. There's some very interesting games in there, and I think that's really when we see can, what Kentucky is uh, starting from about game four on. Well, we, we mentioned it in other videos. Other than the Georgia game, you're looking at all the big games at home, at Kroger Field. You get Florida at home, Missouri at home, Tennessee at home, Alabama at home. So these are all big contests that are in the confines of the Bluegrass State. So we'll see uh, how that how that benefits them. But you know – that Mark Stoops 
and company are going to have the two games against the two teams from the state of Tennessee circled quite prominently. Vanderbilt mm-hmm. as a revenge game, Tennessee as a revenge game. And I think, uh, you know, I think at this point, I think Kentucky has turned the corner and has a better program right now than Florida. So I think, you know, those are all winnable games there. And it's going to be real interesting to see if, if Kentucky takes care of business and is sitting at a, as a one or two loss team with Alabama coming on November 11th. And if Devin Leary's playing well, man, that's going to be an interesting game up in Kentucky. Yeah, lo- lots of interesting games in here. And it, it just seems like the whole league is this year uh, that way. I, I mean, you throw out Georgia, Alabama, LSU – on one side, probably Vandy and and Florida on the other end. Just it seems like so many of these are coin flip games, and Kentucky will be squarely in the middle of, of a lot of those. And I can't wait to see how that turns out. Blaine, anything on the Wildcats worth a discussion that that we didn't get to? Other than are we going to see the trifecta of them drawing Iowa in a bowl game for the third straight year? Man, that would be crazy, wouldn't it? I I think uh, I, I don't think I was going to be quite up to. Uh, New Year's Six level this year, so I, th- I, ho- I think Kentucky's hoping they don't see the Hawkeyes in the postseason because they have higher aspirations than that. But I just think that people need big aspirations. To, yeah, big aspirations. I think that Kentucky needs to be taken seriously this year. I was on a I was on a Tennessee radio station, and I mentioned Kentucky as a contender, and these guys kind of kind of scoffed a little bit. Uh, so. Just remember that Kentucky fans, you can hold that hold that back there. You're not really you can pull the Kirby Smart and say nobody believed in us, you know. So uh, we'll see see if Kentucky's able to use that as motivation this year with people doubting them. But Devin Leary and those receivers, phenomenal, Chris. Yeah, the more I look at this, and we're getting off topic a little bit here. I think second place in the SEC is more up for grabs than I thought a couple of weeks ago. We're doing this right in the middle of July, right before media days. But the more that I dig into teams, Kentucky being one, Missouri for different reasons being another, you can make an argument for South Carolina for various reasons. I think that second place race in the East, I'm not going to say everybody has conceded that to Tennessee. Uh, certainly, I, I, you know, a month ago, I probably – Gave it to the Vols without much of a thought. But the more that I look into some of these teams, and again, Kentucky being right in the middle of that, I think it, it gets very interesting after Georgia. No doubt. No doubt. It's going to be it's going to be wide open and uh, a lot of talented teams. On, on You know, I think Kentucky is the most complete of those teams is why I believe them on the offensive and defensive side. I think Tennessee is the best offensively. Missouri is probably the best defensively. But Kentucky, I think, has a good mix of both. Yeah. All right. We are previewing every single SEC football team for the coming season. We're about halfway done at this point. So we've either done your favorite team, if it's not Kentucky, or we'll be getting to your favorite team within the next week or two. Best way to catch all those, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. That helps us out, helps us get noticed, tell a friend. And also, um, I hear they like basketball in the state of Kentucky. We cover a lot of that, have covered a lot of it during the offseason in baseball. I'm your resident baseball guy. Uh, so we have had a lot of baseball to talk about, even in the middle of the draft. We've done a couple of things there. So if you like your SEC sports in those big three men's sports, we hopefully are your go-to place. We hope you'll come back. Check us out again soon. For Blaine Gilmer, I'm Chris Lee. We're Southeastern 14, and thank you for watching.